Welcome to the Snowbird Investor Way, where we explore what it takes to create your dream cross-border lifestyle, living and investing amongst the sun, sand, and palm trees of Florida, even if you're not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. I'm your host, Coach Rowell. So Rajesh Patel, welcome. You are a commercial off-market deal wholesaler. Would that be accurate to say? A commercial uh, realtor in commercial Houston, realtor. Texas. And I work with the uh, off-market uh, apartment buildings, land deals, hotels, um, even you know acquiring small to mid-sized businesses. I have a lot of connections in that space. So kind of a, a jack of all trades, I guess you can say in the, in the real estate space. Very nice. Okay, we'll get into that in just a sec. Uh, we were just talking about why Florida is an attractive state similar to Texas. Can you continue on that train of thought? So why is Florida a good state to, for the type of business that you're in? Um, I think Florida is a robust market in a lot of different aspects. I think uh, one thing that's a major driver, especially during the pandemic, you had a lot of people that moved to Florida, uh, part, particularly because uh, when there was COVID restrictions, the state of Florida continued uh, to do business. Um, they let businesses stay open. Um, tourism was also uh, at its peak because there was all the other vacation spots around the United States and world were closing down. Florida was stayed open. So a lot of people got exposed to the Florida market and what it had to offer. And they started telling their friends and family and, and eventually the news got wind of it. And next thing you know, there was a, a migration of like geese from the Northeast to the Midwest. People were just flowing into Florida. And so uh, a lot of population growth, uh, you know, the government's, uh, I think the, the climate is there year round, super sunny, great weather, great beaches, family friendly environment, um, conservative. Um, and then uh, second, I think it's also um, pro, pro business, the government. The government there wants new businesses. They want new enterprise to come to Florida, uh, especially a lot of the major Fortune 500s. They were having a lot of relocation to that region, especially, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the financial services companies in the Northeast, uh, from New York to Delaware, Connecticut, a lot of those companies were relocating their offices to Florida uh, because they wanted to be part of that story. They wanted to be in a state that was, you know, the taxes were low, uh, you know, there's robust population growth, um, affordable living for all of their executives and, and co uh, co-workers and uh, company. Um, people. And uh, I think that's what really was the, the main driver for, and I think that's the continuing driver, is that a lot of companies are relocating because the states that they're in just don't have, uh, you know, they're not pro-business. They're not, they don't want to, it seems like they want to tax every corporation very heavily. And, uh, you know, whenever, you're in a market like this, uh, you have to watch all your expenditures. And um, if you can't sustain, you have to leave, you have to move, you have to evolve. And I think Florida is on that evolution uh, process where, uh, you know, they're a hub of activity, not just for local companies, but even for international companies uh, from South America, all the way to the East Pacific, Asia, India, you're having a lot of companies come to Florida and want to be part of that uh, you know, that business environment that's pro-business, you know, uh, capitalistic, uh, you know, to, but uh, other states, I feel like they're, they're focusing more on social issues and other things. And that's a whole nother topic, you know, but mm -hmm. at the same token, if you want to do business, you want to make money in America, I think the Southern belt, you know, Florida, Texas, you know, and, and all, all these states, I mean, that, that are in that region are just, flourishing. I mean, the Carolinas. Um, and so I think uh, what used to be, uh, you know, the Midwest and uh, the the East, uh, you know, um, your New York, your Chicago, your LA's of the world, I think uh, the times have changed. And I think Miami, Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, uh, Tampa, Orlando, I mean, these are the cities people are speaking about now. And I think... Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, everybody wants to be part of that growth and uh, you don't want to be the last one there because if you are, then you would have to pay a premium to be there. And so right. I think you have a finite amount of time to uh, definitely take advantage of the situation. I agree. Totally. And I, a lot of uh, guests that I've interviewed recently uh, mentioned the pandemic and that's uh, a lot of our guests are actually Canadians who have um, either increased or just discovered Florida in their lives uh, because of the pandemic. And it's interesting because it, it's almost like it fast forwarded people to when, when people were stuck and locked down at home, especially Canada and a lot of the northern states, uh, New York State, uh, especially California also, the more the, the socialist kind of states were suffering from these multiple and, and cons consecutive lockdowns. And it caused people to really have time to think about their life and like, okay, so uh, where, where, where am I going to see myself with this new normal? I mean, we didn't know if or when the whole world was going to open up. So people look to Florida and they're like, let's go where it's sunny. Plus they're open. Oh, and look at that. They have no state income taxes and they're business friendly. So it's like, now that the pandemic is over, pretty much the whole world is back to wide open again. We're still seeing people moving into Florida and businesses like when you're a large national or multinational company to move one or even your head office to a new state, like that's not something you do just because of something that happened last year. It's that's we're talking about economic fundamentals as you were touching upon. Right. So that that's really interesting that you see it that way as well. But Rajesh, let me ask you, let's let's kind of backtrack a little bit. How did you get your start in real estate in general? And then kind of walk me through as to where you are today and how you help investors like myself and you know our community to be able to acquire more properties. So how did you get your started, first of all? How did you get yourself started? Sure. Um, I feel like I, I grew up in the industry. Um, my family was in the motel hotel business in East Texas. Um, my dad's first property was a 30 room independent motel on Highway 80 in Longview, Texas. And that's where I grew up. Uh, literally was born and raised at the motel and, um, you know, saw my parents, you know, running the operations, front desk, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sometimes they'd even have to be the maids at the property if the maids didn't show up. And so um, I would always, as a kid, help out, you know, in the laundry room, whatnot, um, or just whatever little tasks there were at the motel, you know? Um, and so always, um, and as my dad evolved his business and started getting into more franchise hotels, um, as I got older, you know, uh, I started working the front desk, uh, started wanting to become more involved in the business in a lot of aspects. And, and, uh, that was my high school and middle school and elementary experience, just being in the hospitality industry, you know, uh, understanding how the hotel operations, uh, hotel ownership management works, how that business runs and works. And during that time period, um, you know, I uh, always was inspired by uh, real estate investors because I saw the potential of what they could do and how they could scale. Because a lot of people that started like my dad um, in that same kind of friends group uh, uh, that my dad had of hotel years and uh, motel owners, uh, some of these families have scaled to hundreds of properties now. And, uh, and there's definitely a, a science behind the, you know, I, I like to call the madness, you know, because it's not an easy industry. There's so many different components of operating a hotel and owning a hotel. And so, uh, you know, and I think uh, a lot of that is working hard, being driven, but understanding sometimes you have to let go in your business a bit and trust people. And, uh, and when you find trustworthy people, take care of them because people are the key component of any business that you own and manage. And so um, when I got into, I moved to Houston for college, went to U of H. Um, and then uh, during that time period, I wanted to go to pharmacy school, but realized that after working as a pharmacy tech for a few years that maybe this isn't my cup of tea and I need to get back in the business world. And so changed my major, got a, got a business degree. And then um, after I graduated college, I worked as an energy analyst. And my older brother at that time, he opened up a website uh, that sold uh, products. Uh, it was an e-commerce store. And um, he did really well with that. And uh, so he shifted my family from East Texas to Houston, and it kind of became a family business where we all 
you know, worked on fulfilling orders and working on the Amazon store and then our own personal family's websites. And then after that, uh, what happened was, is that we decided, um, hey, we need to expand. We need to uh, kind of diversify. And so my brother, with all the contacts that we've established in the hotel business, uh, started leveraging what he was making and putting money into deals, into hotel deals. And and so I saw him doing that and I said, oh, you know what, I need to get my real estate license because I, I, I want to get access to these deals and I know how to call people and I know how to make connections. And, and so I got my real estate license and I got out of the energy business, focused full on my family business and building that, but also working on getting my real estate license. And, and then I started doing a little bit of residential, but I knew that wasn't my forte. Um, and I got really interested in the apartment business. And, and I was like, Hey, you know what? I want to work at an apartment building just to understand how the business works. So I started part-time as a leasing agent at an apartment complex just to learn about property management. In eight months, I got a world of experience in, in the apartment property management uh, business. I mean, there's there's so many aspects of leasing, um, you know, uh, making sure that your residents are happy, taking care of work orders are maintained, uh, you know, understanding uh, reporting. Um, and, you know, especially whenever you work for a company that owns so many apartment complexes, how do you, you know, how do you manage that system? How do you uh, make sure your operations are uh, working efficiently? especially because you're managing um, a lot of different types of employees. You know, you're, you're, you're managing the maintenance men, same time you were working with the property manager, you know, and, and so I really enjoyed the business. And I said, you know what, um, I think I'm ready to own one of these things. And I went to go talk to uh, an apartment broker in Houston who's brokered, you know, billions of dollars worth of apartment properties. I mean, he's super seasoned. His name's Tom Wilkinson. He's from KET Enterprises. And, uh, I went to his office to go look at deals. And as soon as Tom started showing me deals and talking about the business, I said, I don't really understand this business on the investment side. And I saw an empty office on my way out. And I said, Tom, do you ever consider hiring an associate? And uh, Tom was like, yeah, maybe I, 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 I did think about it. A few months later, he calls me up. He's like, hey, um, are you still interested? I'm like, oh, yeah, absolutely. So I, I jumped in the office, got into multifamily investment sales and and after that, it just learned so much about the industry, underwriting, multifamily properties. Um, I, I met, I had connections with uh, apartment owners, lenders, um, you know, even contractors, construction companies, developers. Um, and that's what really, um, you know, I guess amplified, you know, my, my game because uh, mm -hmm. then I was able to, you know, the first property I sold was uh, like a 60 unit in a small town in Texas. And then after that, you know, it just became a ripple effect. I just, I did really mm -hmm. well in my um, apartment sales career, uh, partially because I understood what it took, takes to buy an apartment complex because I understood the operations side because I worked in operations, you know. Um, and then also I had a deep rooted connection with lenders property management companies and and uh, prop apartment owners. Um, I have a lot of friends that are apartment owners as well. So, um, you know, that helped fuel my career as well. And uh, so uh, let me jump in here for a sec. In Florida, in your experience, what let's start kind of big picture. What what markets are looking good for commercial residential apartment complexes? I, I think and the, why? Uh, I think definitely Miami and the surrounding areas around Miami, um, you know, Orlando, Orlando's booming, um, mm -hmm. Tampa, um, you know, any of the, the college cities in Florida, the university towns. Um, and uh, I think I was most impressed, honestly, with uh, Orlando, because the last time I went to Orlando, I just saw construction cranes everywhere. Saw yes. a lot of population migration, a um, lot of these uh, kind of built to rent communities that are being developed. Um, so a lot of, lot of upside over there right now. I think also, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of big companies that are in Orlando as well. I mean, you know, you, you have a lot of family recreation uh, out there, um, 
you know, uh, entertainment parks, whatnot. And that's kind of adding a, a lot of jobs to the market and causing other industries to come about because of those mm -hmm. uh, industries. And so, uh, so to reiterate, what are some of the things that you're looking for when you're entering a market? So from the point of view of someone who might be listening to this from Canada, for example, it's literally a foreign country where they're looking to invest. And so basically the whole state is, is their oyster. What would be some of the economic fundamentals you can suggest to look at when someone is deciding on first, which market to, to make their entry point? Um, I think I definitely look at, um, you know, maybe a lot of regional forecasting reports, understand, you know, what the local economy is looking like um, through kind of a micro perspective by reading, um, you know, maybe news articles or um, uh, just data that's given from the city government about what's happening, um, understanding the kind of the macro uh, reading reports about what's happening in Florida, what companies are planning to migrate there, uh, move over there. I think that's really important. Job growth is super important, um, population growth, and uh, also affordability. Um, you mm -hmm. want to make sure that, you know, you're in a market where um, that affordable factor is still there um, because if it becomes unaffordable, you might end up losing residents to other markets. Yeah. So um, I think those are some fundamentals that you need to keep, keep an eye on. But also, I think um, just understanding what, the future growth potential of that market is going to be, um, you know, if you get wind of a, of a major company that might relocate their headquarters to that particular city um, through something you saw on CNBC or, you know, reading in the wall street journal, keep your eyes on it because, you know, uh, if you can buy out there before everybody else, I think that's where you catch the upside. Cause if you're going yeah. in, once it starts developing, then you're paying a premium. So mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's basic real estate. 101 is, you know, get in before everybody else, you know? Um, yeah, as I often say, uh, a good shorthand for people when they're entering a new market is follow the jobs. Follow right? the jobs. As to, to your point, if there's a, a major employer moving in or a this, if the area is particularly open to business, to attracting business relocation, sometimes they might give like uh, tax breaks or other incentives for employers to set up shop, and then that's always a good a good place to start. From your research, I know you already listed off a few cities and markets in Florida, but from your research, which one or two markets tick off all those boxes uh, that you just mentioned? Um, I definitely think Tampa is one of them, and Orlando, mm -hmm. um, and its surrounding markets. Um, yeah, coincidentally, those are the two finalists for my choice when I moved from Toronto down to Florida uh, six years ago. We're looking at either Tampa or Orlando. It ended up being Orlando, but um, for other reasons, maybe we'll get into, but it's more about, I'm curious about why you see Tampa and Orlando as, as good starting points economically. I think definitely the affordable housing that's being developed there, um, you know, company relocation that's happening to each of those markets. Um, from a variety of different companies, whether it be financial services or uh, consumer goods, um, everybody wants to create an office in either of those markets. Uh, uh, also, there's there's a good uh, 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 labor pool out there. You know, people that'll work, uh, you know, um, and be consistent uh, and not, uh, you know, not have to you don't have to deal with the union factors and and all that. You know, and so. Um, like I said, pro business, pro government, um, great weather, um, you know, not and very not as much crime as some of the other cities uh, mm -hmm. in the US, right? I think everybody wants to be located in a city where the crime rate is, uh, you know, a lot less and, uh, you know, where there's ample schools and, um, you know, ample things for you and your family to do on the weekends, a lot of recreational activities, right? Whether it be beaches, parks, um, family entertainment centers, uh, retail, there's a plethora of retail in each of those um, markets. Um, people want to be close to their grocery store these days. No one wants to drive five miles to go to the nearest grocery store, you know. Um, so having amenities as close as possible to you, um, I think 
Tampa and Orlando both do a really good job of that because I've just seen a glut of uh, retail in each of those markets. And so mm-hmm. with that retail also comes apartments and housing and everything else that's to follow. And so I think, uh, you know, this is a, this is a great moment in time to, to be living in Florida. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I think, uh, you know, international investors are also getting wind of the Florida story uh, from places, you know, in South America, a lot of South American capital is coming in, a lot of Asian capital, uh, European capital, you name it. I mean, um, even Middle Eastern capital. I mean, you know, uh, I was just in Dubai recently and, uh, you know, talking with some people out there and they were telling me uh, that, you know, Texas and Florida are probably the two of the most likely states that they would like to migrate to if they ever moved over here. Um, mm-hmm. Because it's the weather's all very similar, um, you know, and just the opportunity, you know, to, to, to make money and flourish. Cause I think what happened, especially, um, and I don't know if this was true for you, but, uh, for me, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, when I was watching the news during COVID during the time of the pandemic, um, you know, they just kind of made the Midwest and the West coast and the East coast look just very sloppy in a way, you know, I mean, the, 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 go- the governments there didn't really have control of the hospital systems or the people and there was rioting and all sorts but i feel like texas and florida really put their foot down and said hey we're not gonna allow any of this nonsense because we want you know people to feel safe and feel at home and uh and that's why i support you know florida to the 10th degree i'm i think uh you know wherever you do business you want a pro-business government, you want a government that's going to be, uh, create a controlled environment to do business as well. Um, mm-hmm. not, you know, run amok. Yeah. I don't know. You know? Um, yeah. It's interesting uh, as well. You mentioned that because again, snowbird investor way podcast is, uh, mainly Canadians who have an affinity for Florida and, and maybe considering investing through, uh, real estate or through businesses. And, uh, but it's interesting. You mentioned that it's not just Canadians who are pouring money into the state of Florida. It's internationally as well, like Asia, Europe, South America. Uh, and you see that when you walk down the streets here, it's not just all theme parks, but it's, there's an international mix of people. And it, you can kind of guess that they don't all live here because they're all speaking different languages as yeah. well. Uh, in your so let's bring it up to the present as to how it is that you help investors do you have any recent examples of commercial uh properties that you come up with somewhere in florida or you know the type of inventory that that is to be had in the space that you operate in sure yes uh, i just joined recently with a company called offered and offered has a very unique platform that's uh, ai driven and it helps investors, uh, multifamily investors find off market multifamily properties in multiple markets throughout uh, the United States. And uh, in Florida, we have a relationship with a lot of uh, apartment owners, private equity, uh, private capital groups, uh, hedge funds, you name it. You know, you have someone on our team that has access to um, those types of networks and those types of investors. And so a lot of the best properties are going to be traded off market. They're not listed yeah. on your CoStar or LoopNet or they're not for the public eye. A lot of the best properties are traded right away underneath the table, you know, between, uh, you know, brokers direct or, or even just property owner, property owner, you know? Um, and so my advice to anybody who wants to get into the market is uh, make relationships with brokers and lenders. They're going to be your, your best friends, take them out to lunch, you know, drinks, whatever you got to do. Because uh, when in the next six to 12 months, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity to purchase because some people may have overpaid for assets and uh, we're going to start seeing a lot of properties come back to lenders. And so that's the time to buy. So if you have capital right now to deploy, you know, uh, definitely, you know, try to make your moves right now because you have a finite amount of time before everybody else jumps in and the prices get inflated and we're back to the 
back to the rodeo trying to catch the bull. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can be a resource for that. So uh, full permission to toot your own horn. How do you help investors specifically with acquiring uh, off-market commercial properties? Well, first, uh, you know, uh, you know, building that relationship with uh, that off-market property owner, letting them know that, hey, look, I have a database of close to what my own personal database has about 3000 uh, apartment owners. Um, but uh, just within our company, uh, depending on the market, for example, uh, Houston, I mean, we have almost 270 to 300 qualified uh, apartment buyers at the moment who are ready to to jump and purchase these properties. So, um, you know, and when you say apartment buyers, are these like, is there a minimum number of units that you're looking at to say, cause you know, a duplex is technically multifamily, but, uh, is there like a lower threshold, uh, above which you specialize in, or is it all from duplexes up to whatever hundreds? Um, well, I mean, these could be anywhere from like a hundred units to, you know, 500 units, but I've sold properties that are smaller as well. I have relationships with property owners that, you know, have 19 units, 20 units, 40 unit properties. Uh, and so, um, you know, it just depends on what's in your wheelhouse, what you're looking for, you know, uh, how many units are you trying to uh, purchase? Um, as of now, I mean, my relationships are one thing, but also my team, uh, has an exorbitant amount of knowledge. I mean, we have people that have been in the industry for 25, 30 years plus, you know, uh, who have been uh, lenders, worked in appraising uh, for appraisal districts. Uh, and uh, we have uh, people that are, are actu actually principals and in deals, investors in deals. Um, and so, you know, we have a debt and equity team in house. Um, we have access to a lot of property management companies. So, we can kind of help help you out from A to Z, uh, mm -hmm. depending on what you need. But first and foremost, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. It's this is a super competitive business, so you got to have your ducks in a row before you come try to sit on the table. You know, because there's there's going to be a lot of competition because everybody mm -hmm. wants to be in the apartment business. So what do you mean by that? Give me an example of how, what what ducks should they get in a row to be able to be ready to, to purchase? Um, I think definitely have that, that, uh, capital raised sitting on the sideline, you know, um, to deploy, uh, whenever you show your proof of funds, um, and you show, you know, your track record, your team's track record, your group's track record, your capital company's track record. I think it makes a big difference. Um, rather than coming as a one-off owner or, you know, a one-off buyer who's, Hey, I want to get in the apartment business. Like, you have to come with the army. Um, you have to uh, show your credibility in the market. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, having the funds is one thing, but also uh, letting people know you have access to, uh, you know, uh, a property management company. If you don't have your own in-house property management company, you have a relationship that's already built in. Uh, you already know who's going to be managing that asset and you're going to show them their track record as well. You know, hey, they manage 100 properties. These guys are seasoned. If I buy this B-class apartment complex, I'll have no problem with finding a property management company. I have a season one that can come in and take care of, um, you know, and do and take care of this property. Uh, I think, um, yeah, that's. How can people get in touch with you if any part of, you know, your story uh, of what you've shared with us resonates with them? How can, how can they reach out to you? Um, you can contact me through uh, LinkedIn. My name is Rajesh, R-A-J-E-S-H, uh, nicknames Raj Patel. Add me on LinkedIn. Um, you can go to our website, uh, offered.com, O-F-F-E-R-D.com. Um, you can also um, contact me via email. Um, but yeah, I'd love to connect, love to see how I can help you all. Okay. Wonderful. I think uh, that's probably not going to be the last time that you and I talk. Very interesting stuff, but that's the, the amount of time we've got allotted for today. Rajesh Patel out of uh, what city in Texas again? Houston. Houston, Houston, Texas. And uh, you specialize in off-market uh, commercial properties in both the state of Texas as well as in Florida. 
Correct. Correct. Yep. Awesome. All right. So very make sure if you're listening to this, reach out to Raj and uh, he'll help you get your, your first or your next uh, commercial residential property deal under underway. Thank you again for having me. This, this was great. Um, definitely want to do this again. Thanks for Josh.